back to Am I Famous Yet? This is Chapter 9, The Big City. Next stop, New York City. After college, I moved up north to Gotham with the intention of gaining employment in the music industry, specifically at a major record label. This was a logical extension of my music director gig at the college radio station, as well as the next step in being able to procure free vinyl for life. I spent my first summer in town searching for an apartment and a job. By the fall, I had landed a six foot by 12 foot room in a welfare hotel that was upgrading to student and artist housing. It was cheap. I'll give it that much. Sure, the shared bathroom was down the hall, but privacy and I guess hygiene is a matter of personal choice. Needless to say, there wasn't a unified tenants association at the aptly named Midway Hotel. I like to think of it as being midway between life and death. Only a few months into my residency there, a full-sized studio room opened up, which was a full 12 feet by 12 feet. So I upgraded and built myself a loft bed out of plywood and two by fours I bought from the local hardware store. I was living pretty high on the hog, you know, for living in a welfare hotel. I stayed there for about a year. Eventually, a gal pal of mine gave me a line on an illegal sublet on Forsyth Street on the Lower East Side bordering Chinatown. Her uncle, who was actually her mother's extramarital affair, I think, used to like to ship out to foreign lands every so often on years-long contracts as an English teacher, which would leave his rent-controlled apartment vacant and ripe for a subleasee. He was charging me something very cheap at the time, like $375 per month, which made me certain that his rent control rate was even far less than that. It's hard to resent being gouged when the price is that low, however. There are, were a lot of rules and special circumstances around this three-room railroad flat, which was positively palatial after the midway. Firstly, the rent had to be paid to the dude's brother, so that the brother would then pay the landlord with the dude's pre-signed checks to make it look like he was still living there so as not to lose the coveted control of the rent. Secondly, I was never to, under any circumstances, answer a knock at the door. I wasn't immediately sure what havoc this dreaded visitor could potentially visit. Uh, I soon uh, ascertained this was largely to avoid the prying eyes of utility meter readers. The gas meter had been completely removed. There was just an unfettered connection allowing the use of all of the natural gas one could inhale. Similarly, all of the electricity in the apartment could be traced through a long line of extension cords to one master supply cord that came in from outside of the apartment window. I'm pretty sure it went to the guy's apartment next door, though I never fully inquired. It's hard, to Im hard for me to imagine what possible threat my landlord held over his next door neighbor to make the neighbor think that this electrical arrangement was a good idea. I'm speaking about this strictly from a financial arrangement, saying nothing about the fire safety of said arrangement. I'm also quite unsure what would make the neighbor not just unplug the single cord, plunging my life into darkness while dude was away in Saudi Arabia for a year or more. There were other more interesting aspects of living there as well as occasionally having to step over sleeping bodies to get in the door, walking by the working girls in the corner, or taking a shower. In the old tenement buildings, the bathtub was in the kitchen in the center of the apartment. This was a tub, not a shower. Initially, this was meant to be used as a laundry tub or a very small person's bathing area. Starting in 1901, when New York City passed a law requiring cold running water to be available to all tenants, Bathing at home became a real possibility, and proper-sized tubs were installed. When this law got amended to include hot and cold running water in 1929, the landlords only ran one hot pot water pipe up into the apartments to save money. The only hot water was therefore in the kitchen and tub room, not in the toilet water closet, which was at the back of the apartment. To take a shower, it was necessary to fashion some sort of high-mounted shower nozzle as well as some sort of shower curtain to contain the spray. The only easy way to do this was to construct a 360 degree shower rod hanging from the ceiling from which you could suspend two standard sized shower curtains to get the job done. In order not to have a giant opaque object in the middle of the kitchen blocking all the light from the security gate covered windows, the best choice was clear plastic shower curtains. In my mind, I exchanged the word shower for the words display case as in, I just got back from a run, I need to take a quick display case before I go out for the evening. It was a lifestyle. Concurrent with my housing search was my employment search. After pounding the pavement for about three months, I landed three job offers at about the same time. 
Since they were so close together, I was able to manage to spend a day or more at each offered position before making my decision. Job number one was as the assistant of the president of a large independent record label called Tommy Boy, who had some major hip-hop artists. It was an interesting place to work at the center of all aspects of the label. It could have been an invaluable learning experience, but the gig only paid $12,000 per year. Even in 1980s dollars, I asked the boss how someone was supposed to live on that little amount of money. He replied without the slightest hint of irony, you live in Brooklyn and you temp on the weekends. Reality adequately checked. I worked there for one week. Job number two was for TV Tunes, later TVT Records, a label that had started by putting out albums of, you guessed it, television theme songs. They sold well enough for them to eventually sign artists and make a go of it as an actual record label. This job offer was for the princely sum of $18,000 per year. While this was a much more manageable wage for someone having low overhead by living in welfare hotels in illegal rent-controlled sublets, there was a catch. The gig was basically seven days a week, 10 to 12 hour days. Again, without any irony, the label owner said that I wouldn't have any weekends for a while. It was a 70 hour per week job. I worked there for one day. Job number three was as a per diem assistant in the publicity department of Epic Records. It also paid $18,000 per year, but for a 40 hour work week. The only catch here was that pesky phrase per diem. This was a loophole whereby a major corporation, in this case CBS Records, could pay me only for the days I worked, no paid vacation, no health insurance, no benefits. I was just out of college. This was a major label, which had been my goal all along. I was in. It was my job to answer phones, duplicate and mail out press photos and bios, run errands as needed, and very occasionally to accompany artists to press interviews. After a year and a half, I worked my way up to the position of manager of West Coast Publicity, a title that came with a corporate Amex card, an expense account, full benefits, and the lavish salary of $26,000 per year. This required a move out to Los Angeles, of course, but I was more than happy to pursue my music business aspirations. The only slight problem was that I was completely miserable. Los Angeles just wasn't my tempo. I was lonely and having trouble adjusting to life in a new city where I knew nobody. My introversion level ratcheted up while trying to do a job that is by definition social. Being a publicist requires being an expert schmoozer, social butterfly, and a brilliant salesman. I was and am none of these. I hated the job, hated most of my coworkers, hated many of the publicity campaigns I was asked to work on, and hated most of the music I was promoting. I did learn a couple of important things while being a major label publicist. For example, let's say there was a horrible album on the release schedule that needed to be promoted. For the first step that was to write an artist's biography which I seem to be able to do, unlike all of the other payroll, publicists on the payroll. They all farmed out their bios and press releases to freelance writers. I did some of that too, so I could get some money to my writer pals, and get them some extra money, but I wrote most of my artist stuff myself. Writing a biography became an exercise in extolling virtue. I realized that even though it could be a huge steaming pile of doo-doo, somebody liked this record. It might only be the singer's mom who was proud of her son or daughter's major label debut, but somebody liked it. It became my job to figure out who this was and why. It became easier to write the bio from that perspective. It didn't make the record any better, but it made the press materials at least more positive and less about bullshit hype. One of the most telling things that indicated exactly to what level of hell I had descended was when the vice president of product management, one of the big dudes at the label, told me to my face, I don't know anything about music. I could be selling soap. It doesn't matter. This was the dude who had made Gloria Estefan a huge star among others. Reality checked once again. The music business had nothing to do with music. It wasn't all misery. I did get to work with some excellent bands and one particularly important campaign for Living Colors' first album, Vivid. Not only were they amazing musicians and writers, they were also socially relevant and just great people. I'm proud of the work I was able to do with them. I also got to work with my bass hero, Stanley Clark. Stanley remains an old pal to this day and still introduces me to his jazz legend peers as his former student and the busiest guy he knows. Uh, I did actually take a couple of lessons in, from him back in LA, but I think he's just being kind introducing me that way. I have gold and platinum album award plaques from my epic record days from Living Color, Luther Vandross, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts, Michael Jackson, and Weird Al Yankovic. 
though I fear the Luther and Michael Plax got pawned for crank somewhere in North Carolina during a decades-long stint in storage in my dad's attic. Well, I certainly did work with all those artists. The platinum records were kind of given out like inter-office bowling trophies. That stack of awards was amassed in just in a year and a half of being a publicist. I even got to uh, a raise to $30,000 per year by the end of it. But it was the end. I needed to go. I needed to see if I could work making music rather than marketing horrendous corporate product. After only three years in the biz, I was cooked. <laughs>